Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Greek tomato feta fritters. That's right, I'm going to show you my take on tomato keftetes, which is exactly how you're supposed to pronounce it. Well, actually, I'm not really sure. I mean, I did watch some videos to learn how to say it right, and I heard five different people say it six different ways. But anyway, these are incredibly delicious, not to mention versatile and inexpensive. And I think just an absolutely perfect summertime appetizer. And to get started, the first thing we'll do is prep some beautiful vine-ripened tomatoes. Well, at least some of these are. Okay, it's still kind of early in the season, but I did grow these sun gold tomatoes and a couple small romas, and then I hedged my bets with a few from the store. And if you're using cherry tomatoes, we can go ahead and cut those in quarters if they're small. And then for larger tomatoes, romas or otherwise, I just like to cut them in half and then in like quarter inch thick slices. And once those are halved and sliced, we can go ahead and turn them and cut them across like this. And then I really hope you have a bench scraper because once these are cut, I'm gonna go ahead and transfer them into this measuring cup and I wanna try to get as much juice off the cutting board as I can. But anyway, the point is we're gonna dice up a couple cups of the sweetest, best vine ripened tomatoes we can find. And then to that, we will add some sliced green onion or whatever kind of onion you're into. And no, it doesn't have to just be one kind. And then for our last vegetable addition, we'll go ahead and grate in about half a medium zucchini. Oh, and be careful when you get down to the end. All right, don't be a hero trying to get every last speck of that zucchini. Because nobody, and I mean nobody, wants a piece of your knuckle in their fritter. And that's it. Once we have our veggies prepped, we need to add a generous amount of kosher salt, as well as a little bit of sugar, some freshly ground black pepper, and a few shakes of cayenne just to stay in shape. And then we'll also at this point add some dried oregano. Okay, we are gonna add lots of fresh herbs to this, but we'll toss that dry oregano in now so it starts to hydrate. And that's it, we'll give that a proper spooning. And then once that is mixed, what we'll do is just let that sit for 15 minutes, which is gonna give that salt and sugar time to draw out those delicious liquids from the vegetables, which not only improves the flavor, but it's also gonna create moisture, which is gonna combine with the flour to make the batter. And after sitting for 15 minutes, we'll go ahead and give that a stir. And you can see here at the bottom how much liquid has been drawn out. So that's looking good, which means we can go ahead and toss in our freshly chopped herbs. And I'm gonna do some Italian parsley, some mint, and some basil. And if you wanted, you could also add some dill, which a lot of people do like. So use what you want. I mean, you are after all the John Ritter of this Greek fritter, and you don't have to enjoy the same herb threesome I did. And then next up, we'll go ahead and add about three ounces of feta cheese, preferably Greek feta, since that just makes a lot of sense here. But any kind of feta would work, as long as it's tasty and dry enough to crumble like this. All right, some fetas are really soft and sticky, and those are gonna be a lot harder to work with. And that's it, once this has been cheesed, we'll go ahead and take a spoon and give it a quick mix before we add our final two ingredients, which could actually just be one ingredient if you wanted. Since once this is mixed, we'll go ahead and dump in some all-purpose flour, plus some baking powder. And of course, if you have self-rising flour, which already has baking powder in it, you could just add that and be done. But either way, once that's in, we'll take a spoon and give this a final mix. And hopefully this batter ends up with a perfect consistency. But if it doesn't, we'll simply adjust. Okay, if it seems too dry and thick, we'll give it a little water. And of course, if it seems too wet and loose, we'll add some flour. But for once, the stars were aligned, and this actually came out to the exact thickness I was going for, which is something still relatively loose, but it will still sit up and hold its shape on a spoon. And that's it. We could if we want to cook this right away, but I do think it comes out better if we wrap it up and pop it in the fridge for about a half hour. And yes, you can go longer, even overnight if you want to, but whether you let your batter rest or not, we'll go ahead and fry this up in 350 degree oil, which could be in a deep fryer, but if you don't have one, we can just shallow fry it in about an inch of oil that we will get up to temperature over medium high heat. And it can be hard when we shallow fry to get an accurate temperature, which is why one of these laser thermometers is so useful. And your cat will love it too. And once that oil is up to 350, we'll go ahead and carefully transfer in a nice heaping tablespoon of our batter. And we can use a second spoon to help push it off. And because we are shallow frying, if one seems to be sticking up a little high, we can give that a little press. Oh, and I should mention, if you did leave this batter in the fridge longer than a half hour, like a few hours or overnight, 
those vegetables will release more water, and you might have to tighten it up with a little more flour. So some to pay attention to. And that's it. We'll go ahead and fry these for a couple minutes per side or until beautifully browned and hopefully cooked through. And once those are placed in, I like to reduce the heat to medium so that oil doesn't get too hot. But of course, that's something you can monitor with your laser or just regular probe thermometer. But I do like to back the heat down a little bit once these are frying. And after two minutes, we'll go ahead and flip those over. And let me give you a great tip here. Don't burn yourself which is why I like to have a fork in my other hand in case I need to help soften the landing. And that's it, once those are flipped over, we'll give that other side about two minutes. At which point I do what you're supposed to never do, flip them back over. I know you're not supposed to, I just admitted that. But just like the twice cooked french fry, I always feel by flipping it back over, maybe that surface gets a little more crispy. I don't know and I can't prove it, but I did give those one more flip for about 30 seconds. And by the way, I do not buy they're going to absorb a whole bunch of oil if you do this. All right, these things have a ton of moisture in them. And moisture and oil do not get along. Okay, they repel each other. So if these were a lot starchier, maybe. But with a batter this wet, I really don't think it's going to be a big problem. But anyway, that extra flip is optional. And once those have cooked at least a couple minutes on each side, I went ahead and fished them out. And please take a good look at the color now. Because once I get them on that white towel, on that white plate and I move those to my countertop, thanks to the auto brightness on my camera, the edges are gonna look kinda burnt, which they really weren't, not that much. And you're probably thinking, who cares what they look like? What do they sound like? Well, they sound nice and crispy. Oh yeah, fork don't lie. So those sounded right, and I moved on to the tasting, which you could do as is, but they're also really good with some freshly squeezed lemon, or as you'll see in a few minutes, any kind of yogurt sauce. But anyway, I squeezed down a little bit of lemon and went in for a bite. And that, my friends, was just tremendous. And appearances notwithstanding, they had the perfect texture, which is crispy on the outside, but still soft and moist on the inside. But not soft and moist from undercooked batter. That would not be good, and you would taste that pasty raw flour. But they stay soft and moist on the inside, thanks to our feta and tomatoes and zucchini. Oh, and while these really are good warm, I think I like them even better at room temp. So I went ahead and snacked on a couple of those, and then I cooked up a few more and plated those up properly. And by properly, I mean served with a nice yogurt sauce, which was nothing more than yogurt, lemon juice, and some raw garlic. Oh, and of course a shake of cayenne. Oh, and it might be useful to know for future reference that this is pretty much the exact same recipe for any kind of vegetable fritter. All right, as long as it's something that's going to be edible with just a couple minutes of frying, it will absolutely work inside these. So if it's something like a green bean or like broccoli or something that's going to be too hard, that won't cook in that shorter time, just simply blanch them first until they're just about tender and then dice them up and proceed as shown. So you really can get kind of creative here, as well as obviously switching out the seasonings and the spices and of course the cheese, although it really is hard to beat feta. And right here, I'll give you one more close-up look at that inside texture, which again is quite moist. And the combo of that sweet, juicy tomato, along with that salty, funky, tangy feta, is just absolute fried fritter perfection. Fritter perfection. Fritter perfection. Which is really hard to say. And I thought the motto cathetes was hard. But anyway, I'm not paid to pronounce things right. I'm paid to teach you to cook things like this, which I might have just done. Which is why I'll finish up by saying, I really do hope you give these a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.